Good afternoon, hello and welcome. I am Melissa Greer, I'm the Program Manager for Parkinson's Resources of Oregon. And I was just saying I'm a little nervous because this is our first webinar for 2019, um, so this is exciting. And just wanted to kind of give a brief overview of Parkinson's Resources. We are a nonprofit here based in Portland, but we also have two offices, um, one in Central Oregon and one in Eugene, um, with full-time employees there. And um, so if those are, if you're in any of those regions, um, you have a local person, a local pro person. And so what our organization does is we provide information and support and education services for people with Parkinson's disease and family members. Um, and this is one of the, the education platforms that we use. Um, this um, makes is an online, obviously a live online um, resource that we host these various, various topics um, to make information available to people throughout Oregon, Southwest Washington, and even beyond. Um, and this is recorded in the hopes that everything goes well with technology. And we do have a YouTube page where we provide all of the recorded webinars. So thank you so much for coming today. And before I get started, just kind of wanted to go over a little um, housekeeping items. There is a, um, you will see on the right side that you have a little browser box. And um, this is where you can submit your questions in that question box. Um, you will notice that your everyone is muted and we do that on purpose. I'm sorry that we won't be able to hear your lovely voices. And um, at the end of the program, we will be taking about 15 minutes to answer some of those questions. Some of you have already submitted questions. And yeah, we're going to get started. And um, also just wanted to let you know that we are, um, I will be kind of jumping back on before we take some questions to kind of go over a few items as well. Um, but today we're really excited because today we have Julie Olette. She is the owner and senior living consultant for the Northwest Senior Resources. And she will be talking about senior housing today, talking about affordability costs um, and just how do you choose and how do you navigate that and some of the differences. We will not be seeing Julie's lovely face today. Um, she is having a bit of a cold, as we all are um, stuck inside, but we will um, be seeing all of her slides, and then um, you will also hear her voice. If you do you have any technical difficulties, you can also write that in the questions box as well, and hopefully um, we will get that all sorted out. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Julie. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I am here to talk about senior housing and the types of choices there are, as well as cost, and how you can, um, different options for paying for it. Um, we will start with the initial um, information. And I want to just share that I am going to be speaking globally so when it comes to specifics, there are always caveats to what I am saying. I am just going to be talking very generally. Um, when I discuss pricing, it's also just for one individual, not couples. There's always a second person fee and potentially additional chair, care charges if that second person needs care as well. Um, I'm also referring to the Portland Metro market that's where we work we cover the entire tri-county area so when i speak specifically about pricing that's the market i'm referring to um, one last piece with all communities they typically have a one-time move-in fee and that ranges usually between about a thousand dollars to five thousand with the average being about two thousand to twenty five hundred for most communities there are six different types of senior housing. Um, the first one is independent living. That's where folks um, can manage all of their activities of daily living. The next one is assisted living, where you need some support, but still like a social model. Then there's memory care. Um, which is a secured unit for folks that might wander or um, have self-safety concerns and need more support. 
Then there's adult foster care, which are small five room private homes. And then residential care is a little different. It's um, a step up from assisted living, but not quite as much care as an adult foster care. And then the last is an immediate care facility, which is basically what we all think of as a nursing home. And I'm gonna delve deeper into each of those levels. So independent living, um, they typically offer a multitude of activities. Um, they offer anywhere from one to three meals a day, uh, depending on each individual's choice. They provide usually three meals a day, but not all include, include that in their rent. Some people want to only have, say, dinner and fix breakfast and lunch in their own apartment. So there's uh, flexibility in the meal program. The folks that move into independent living are physically and cognitively capable. So they're able to manage their own bathing, dressing, grooming, etc. Independent living includes most utilities, often the phone is separate, but they usually include cable, water, sewer, garbage, um, electricity, those sorts of things that's included in your monthly rent. Transportation is generally offered and um, it's on a scheduled basis, however, so you need to sign up if you need to go to the doctor or if you want to go to the grocery store, things of that sort. They also have parking for folks that are still driving, so that is not an issue. You can bring your car. Many of the communities have amenities, um, such as a salon, again, dining room for those meals, exercise facilities. Some might have a pool or a chapel, and they generally have some sort of activity or game room. Independent living also has studios, one bedrooms, two bedrooms, or even a two bedroom with a den. There's a couple of communities in town that even have penthouse suites, <laughs> but that's not for everybody. So um, lots of different offerings as far as size of the apartment. And the costs typically range around 2000 on the low end and can exceed 7,000 on the high end, um, but it is inclusive of a lot of services. For folks that need some support and access to care staff, uh, assisted living is the next step. That is offering assistance 24 seven, so they have awake night staff, they have the most social setting of those communities that offer um, care. So there's lots of activities. They often have entertainment coming in. They go on outings. There's parties within the community. There's games, book clubs, things of that sort. Assisted living always provides all three meals plus snacks. So lots of food offerings to choose from, but each apartment does typically have a small kitchenette. So you might have cabinetry, a sink, a microwave, and a refrigerator. They generally do not have ovens and stoves. The type of care that is provided in assisted living is for folks that are safe behind closed doors for about two to three hours at a time. So if anybody is not safe in that type of situation where they're in their own apartment but need more eyes on, then that level probably isn't appropriate for that person. You also have to be able to call for assistance when you need help. 
So each building offers some sort of call system. It may be a pull cord or a pendant or bracelet that you wear where you push a button, but there's some way to reach the staff. Again, they do have awake night staff um, at all times, so you can reach somebody 24 seven. In assisted living, the average staffing ratio ranges from one caregiver for every 15 residents up to one caregiver for every 25 residents. Um, so when you are in assisted living, if you call for help, you may wait seven to 15 minutes for somebody to respond because they're also caring for your neighbors. Assisted living typically offers studios, one bedrooms, and two bedroom units. Um, most buildings don't have two bedroom units, but there are some that do. So we can certainly find that if that's what you're interested in. And the costs for assisted living are higher um, because of that 24 seven staff and care needs being met. It ranges from, I would say at the very low end with very light care in a studio, 3,500 and it can exceed 8,500 for a large unit with lots of uh, services being required. But an average is about five to 5,500. Memory care is another offering, and to live in memory care, you must have a diagnosis of dementia. Once in a while, we will see a husband wife that want to stay together, and the state could be requested to provide a waiver for the spouse if they don't have that diagnosis of dementia, but that's very uncommon. It's it's healthier for that person without dementia to live in a different setting than being surrounded with, with folks that do have dementia. So it's, it's rare that we see that. In a memory care, it is always secured by a um, key code entry system so that those folks are safe. They can't wander off and risk getting harmed. Um, so that's an extra safety measure for memory care. They also provide three meals plus snacks daily. Activities are geared around folks with dementia and there's a broad spectrum because a dementia community may have higher functioning folks as well as very low functioning folks as their disease process progresses. So they're trying to meet the bulk of the residents' needs with their activities. Entertainment is always welcome because that tends to be uh, welcome for every level. There's limited transportation in some memory cares. They might go on outings, but when it comes to getting out beyond you know, just a country drive or something of that sort, it, it's not as common um, to go to the grocery store and such because the abilities aren't there. In a memory care, the average staffing ratios are one caregiver for every six residents to one caregiver for every 12 residents. We typically prefer to refer to those communities that have at least a one to 10 ratio in memory care. They do have awake night staff. Most of the rooms I would say are shared, but they do have some private rooms in almost every community. Uh, private rooms are becoming more desired. So we're seeing the newer communities provide more private rooms rather than the shared, but the uh, ex a lot of the existing communities do have shared rooms. And there's that's not necessarily a bad thing. When folks have progressed dementia, there's some comfort in hearing another person in the room uh, and having access to another individual, even if it's just hearing them breathe at night. 
there's a little bit of comfort in that. So it often works. And many folks in this generation have also had spouses for years, as well as grew up in childhood homes, rooming with their brother or sister. So again, that offers comfort for many. The cost of a memory care can be anywhere from about 5,500 to over 10,000, but I would say an average charge is around 6,800. And again, that's based on the community itself, whether it's a private or shared room, as well as um, the care needs, cost of the care needs for each individual. So if you have heavy care needs, the prices are going to be higher. Adult foster care homes are, in my opinion, a wonderful thing. We have almost 900 of them in the Portland metro area. And by law, they can only accept five residents per home. Many of the local homes are actually run by Romanian uh, families, and they are an incredibly kind, caring, and reverent culture. They grew up in their own homes with their grandmothers and grandfathers all the way down to children. So they're multi-generational cultures and they, they do it incredibly well. They're, the bulk of them are very clean, more so than I bet you most of our homes, <laughs> including my own. They're very clean and organized and they typically provide home cooked meals made from scratch. So that's always a, a good bonus. There are other cultures out there besides the Romanians doing it, but um, I, I would say 60 to 70% in the Portland metro area are Romanian run, and I'm a fan. It's not for everybody. There aren't very many activities in an adult foster care home, but for those that are more progressed in their disease process, um, it's fabulous care. They do not provide transportation. Um, the few activities they do provide might be once a week a, a guitar player might come in or music therapist and they might do puzzles or they might watch different shows as a group, things of that sort. They all are typically private rooms and some have a half bath within the room, but some also share baths. The showers are always in a separate area or generally in a separate area because in an adult foster care home, the residents generally require assistance with showering. They have probably the best staffing ratios in the industry. They have to have at least one caregiver for those five residents. Sometimes it's a family, a husband, wife, or a mother, daughter, or something of that sort. And so there can be two caregivers for those five residents, but at least one has to be on site at all times. Because they are the owner operator in many cases, they also have pride of ownership. So they want to provide the best care and do things well. It is the most intimate setting and often the most stable staffing because again, it's pride of ownership. Staffing is there 24 seven, however they sleep at night. So if someone needs regular night care, that might not be the right setting. Occasionally we can find a care home that does offer um, awake night staff, but that's not the norm. Um, and if you do need night care, that can significantly add to the, the cost. Cost ranges from, and I'm, in, I'm talking about including light care, typically about 4,000. And on the very, very high end, um, I've seen a, a few homes in town that charge closer to 12,000 for heavy, heavy round the clock care. Um, the average is probably between 4,500 and 5,500. 
but excellent care is gen generally given in that setting. A residential care facility is smaller than most assisted livings. There's typically anywhere from 15 to 40 units, and they offer some of the same care as assisted living, but the staffing ratios are higher. So they can provide more care than most assisted livings. They do provide three meals plus snacks. Most of the rooms are a studio unit with a half bath. And again, the shower room is down the hall because these folks do need assistance with showering. And the shower room is also down the hall typically because that's where accidents can happen if somebody um, is forgetful and thinks they want to try to take a shower on their own, um, they might fall or slip and, and that's why the staff prefers to have them down the hall so they can help encourage that safety. There's fewer activities in a residential care facility, but they do offer some. Transportation is generally not provided. However, they can help arrange for transportation, such as TriMet Lyft or one of the medical transport services. The benefit to a residential care facility over most adult foster care homes is that they do have awake staff 24 seven. So you can always ask or access an awake caregiver if that's needed on a regular basis. Again, in the care home, the staff is always there and they will get up if someone needs assistance, but if you need regular assistance, that may not be the best setting. Cost ranges in a res residential care facility can start at about 4,500 and go to eight or 9,000, but the average is about 6,500. And the highest level of care is an immediate care facility or ICF. This is what we used to call a nursing home. Um, they are required by law to have an RN on duty 24 seven. They also have awake caregivers 24 seven. Those caregivers are required to be licensed as certified nursing assistants. So this is the only setting where the caregivers must have credentials. Most of these are very clinical settings. Um, it's the last place anybody wants to go, but it's required for some rare people. Uh, it's, it's just the least homey, but they, it offers good, high quality, you know, high level of care. They too offer three meals plus snacks. Many times they are shared rooms, but they do have some private as well. Intermediate care facilities charge on a daily basis rather than a monthly basis. And we are seeing the rate anywhere from about 300 a day to 425 a day. So it is not an inexpensive um, option. None of these are inexpensive, but this is the most expensive typically. Um, average is about 11,000 a month. Now, I'm sure a lot of you have questions about how to pay for this. Um, it's, it's daunting, I know. Um, the first one is obviously private pay. If you have the resources to um, cover these costs, that's, that's the most desirable for the operator, for the provider. Um, many folks have long-term care insurance and all but assisted or excuse me all but independent living typically qualify for long-term care insurance to kick in um, every policy is a little bit different but i've seen policies ranging anywhere from 50 dollars a day to i think the highest i saw was about 268 a day so it's a 
a wonderful thing if you've invested in long-term care insurance, but you would have been paying a monthly fee for that, so you would know whether or not you have it. There is a program through the Veterans Administration. It's called VA Aid and Attendance. And some folks can qualify for that benefit. Typically, if you are a retired veteran and you served just one day during active wartime, and there's many dates that this covers, you do qualify for um, the potential benefit of up to, and again, there's caveats here, about $1,800 a month. If you are a surviving spouse, I believe you can qualify for up to $1,100 a month. If you divorced the veteran, and they have since passed away, or even if they're still living, um, divorce takes you out of being a, a surviving spouse benefit. So um, you would have had to still be married when your spouse passed away to qualify for that benefit. And there are, um, each county has its own Veterans Affairs office that you can contact to get more information for that benefit if you think you might qualify. There's, um, the last one is Medicaid. And Medicaid is if you are unable to pay for your care and the government needs to step in and, and assist with that. There's three qualifiers for Medicaid. You must require specific level of care assistance. And that level of care is getting tighter and tighter as far as how to meet those specific needs. But if you are ever being asked about your care needs and you're trying to qualify for your either long-term care insurance benefit or for a Medicaid benefit, I, I want to encourage you, don't try to be prideful. Answer the questions of how you are on your worst day. Don't answer questions how you are on your best day or possibly even your average day. You need to answer those questions like I had a, I'll use an example, I had a um, former resident where I used to work who had Parkinson's and she was living in her own home and the long-term care insurance nurse came out to evaluate her. She was by herself, her daughter wasn't there. Um, and so she was answering the questions of this nurse. The nurse said, can you shower yourself? And this gal said, yes, I can. And she said, can you get yourself dressed? And she said, yes, I can. And they said, can you go out to your mailbox, which was at the end of the driveway, and, and get your mail? And she said, yes, I can. So she disqualified herself for her long-term care insurance. However, she didn't explain to that nurse that she had had four falls in the shower. She didn't explain to the nurse that it took her over an hour to get dressed because she could barely get her socks and shoes on. And she didn't explain to that nurse that she had had a couple of falls going out to the mailbox. So had she mentioned those things, she would have qualified and we were able to requalify her, but it took us a few extra months. So please answer those questions of how you are on your worst days. The second qualification is you can't have more than $2,000 to your name. That means assets, bank account, anything. Um, so you've got to be fairly um, limited, you know, incredibly limited in your assets to qualify financially. And lastly, there are some specific income limits 
This year, it's right around your income can't be more than I believe it's twenty three hundred a month. However, again, there's caveats. There's a process you can work with called an income cap trust. And so if your income is three thousand a month, but your care costs are five thousand a month, you've got to have um, that Medicaid qualification to help you cover your costs. And an income cap trust helps you do that. I would suggest anybody that needs to file an income cap trust, contact an elder law attorney because they can help you through that process. And lastly, I wanna mention um, Providence Elder Place. They are a Medicaid funded program, but they offer so much more than straight Medicaid. So if someone is requiring um, Medicaid assistance to pay for their housing, Providence Elder Place could be a good program to look into. Um, it's, they offer a daycare program, they offer all your medical care, dental care, x-rays, lab work, et cetera all within their program. Um, so if you're interested, that's that's something definitely to check into. Additional pricing inf information. Um, each community typically charges a move-in fee. And we're seeing that currently ranging from 1,500 to 5,000 a month, the average being closer to 2,000. So don't let that 5,000 a month scare you. Um, if you are interested in one of the large continuing care retirement communities, they have a much larger move-in fee, but that a portion of that usually goes back to you or your estate upon move out. And there's only six of those in the Portland metro area. So it's not again for everybody but um their move-in fe fees may be two hundred thousand to eight hundred thousand uh, but that's a an entirely different animal so if you want more information on that we can we can talk at a later date care charges can be based on either points or levels unfortunately there is no standardization of how the care is charged within our industry. What that means is one person's level of care could be a level three at one assisted living building and at another assisted living building, it could be level five. Um, each community has their own rating system. So it, it makes our jar, job a lot harder, but um, it, I can't speak specifically to what your care points or levels may be on an individual basis. A community might have an all-inclusive rate, um, but that's rare. So you don't see that very often. I, I can only think of about three communities that do an all-inclusive rate in the area, but that does happen on occasion. We are seeing um, annual increases in communities, and that averages between three and six percent each year. So when you're budgeting, you may want to be aware of that. Once in a while, like when the economy was down in 2010 and that time frame, we didn't see any increases because everybody was on tight budgets. but in other years, it typically is between three to six percent. If you're interested in staying at home, home care agencies that will send in um, folks to check on you and help typically charge twenty-seven to thirty-two dollars an hour. Most agencies have a three or four hour minimum. So if you only need somebody in the morning to help you get up showered and dressed and going for the day you may have to pay three to four hours even though you only use them an hour 
there are um i know of one agency that will do as little as an hour but that's incredibly rare and their hourly rate is a little bit higher because of the transportation time that it costs them to get to and from you they offer companion care intermediate care and comprehensive care so they are licensed separately for each of those levels so in order to choose the right agency you need to know what their level of licensure is and what your needs are to make sure that they're going to be able to meet your specific needs so but it can be a good option to keep you home a little bit longer if that's your desire Someone had asked questions about um, what if a company changes ownership or how often do the staff changes? And those are really good questions. We don't see a tremendous amount of ownership changes. Uh, they happen occasionally, but it, it, it can happen at any time and since they're private businesses, they don't have to disclose that up front. There was a, a recent community that's been owned in the Portland metro area for 32 years, and I didn't think they would ever change ownership, and they just did. So <laughs> we're, we're anxious to see what happens in, in an um, event like that, because it's been a good community for these 32 years. Management staff changes, um, unfortunately, happen more than we would like. We prefer to take clients that have long-term stability in those management positions, but that's not always possible. I'm afraid this industry is one of the higher turnover industries. Um, and with that said, caregiver turnover is even more. This is not a high paying position, and so a lot of folks will move on to possibly, an, uh, you know, somebody down the street that might be paying more, or perhaps they're just a caregiver while they're going to college or nursing school. And so once they've graduated, they move on as well. Um, but so just know that. But there are some wonderful long term caregivers out there that have been in communities. 5, 10, 15, even 20 years that do it for their heart and don't want to leave a community. And those are the those are the ones we search for, but be aware that it is a high turnover industry, I'm afraid. Another question that was asked is how do we communicate with the staff? Um, first of all, when you're in a community or looking for a community, be entirely transparent about your um, care and personal needs. They can't help you if they don't have all of the information. Make sure staff is aware of your likes and dislikes for either yourself or your loved one. That's incredibly helpful. Give staff thorough information. Um, again, that's crucial. And then ask questions and coach if things could be done differently. Don't hesitate to coach them in a kind way. Um, say, you know what, I don't like it when you transfer me this way. Could you try it this way and see if it um, causes me less discomfort? That's perfectly reasonable. And then again, be kind and encouraging with the staff. It's a hard job. And I, I truly believe that most do it from the heart. So encourage them, thank them, and, and work with them to the best of your ability. That's always helpful. The transition from home to a community is incredibly hard on everybody. Um, yourself, if you're the one moving, and loved ones. Um, it's traumatic. We actually call it um, transition trauma. Uh, Honesty is the best policy when if you're transferring a loved one, if you're moving a loved one, if they are able to accept that. If they have dementia, 
we we use the term compassionate fibs. It's really okay to tell these compassionate fibs in order to assist them if it's in the long run in their best interest for their safety. Also with dementia, you you may want to hold off discussing the move until just a couple of days before because folks with dementia tend to um, focus on something as trauma inducing as a move and it could be awful for those few days uh, for if you do it more than a few days prior to the actual move. When you move, decorate the place to feel like home. Um, have it fully furnished and ready when your loved one arrives. That will help tremendously. Have one family member or a friend take the individual out to lunch, spend a day on an outing and have the rest of the help getting the apartment or room settled with pictures hung and and your favorite chair there and bed, etc. It'll it'll make things feel better when they arrive. And as I spoke, um, transition trauma may occur initially. Settling in typically takes anywhere from two to eight weeks. So know that those first few weeks are going to be the toughest. I have a lot of families come to me and say, gosh, mom is doing so much worse since we moved her. We probably shouldn't have done it. And I always say, no, you moved her because she was already starting to decline and we needed to get her in a safe place. And I would say I've only come across maybe three clients in my 18 years in senior housing that have never settled. Um, the majority of folks settle over time, but again, that initial period is the most difficult. So have patience with yourself and them. And that's uh, basically the conclusion of the slideshow. So we're going to take um, time to do some questions. Melissa? Okay. Yes. I'm here. Sorry. was on mute and <laughs> I wasn't unmuting. Um, so a few of the questions that came in have been pretty specific to people's situation, specific situations. Um, so what I'm thinking that we will do is that we have your email address um, and in some of those questions, um, we'll just go ahead and email you individually and okay. um, address again those kind of specific issues. Um, one thing I'm going to say before we kind of get started is that they're on questions um, is that there have been a lot of questions referring to Parkinson's specific. Um, and what I do want to say is that unfortunately, um, there is no board or licensing for um, oh, and my camera's working now. <laughs> Technology, don't you love it? Um, so unfortunately, there are no board. Um, uh, there's no board or licensing for Parkinson's specific care or any sort of standardization. Um, so you, um, however, there, I feel like the industry is getting, and Julie, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the industry is getting um, a lot more aware of the needs of people with Parkinson's and um, some have actually um, provided certain areas that are specific to Parkinson's. Um, for example, hosting a support group for Parkinson's specific, um, having trained employees when it comes to um, certain exercise programs. So, some, as Julie was mentioning, there's um, you know certain facilities offer um, social activities. One being exercise, um, and we know as quite a few in the area that have Parkinson's specific exercise. So they have had their employees trained. Um, and, and that, um, again, for Parkinson's specific, um, there are certain industry um, facilities, excuse me, or companies that, again, are kind of aware that, you know, the, the baby boomers are aging. Um, Parkinson's prevalence is 
uh, increasing as well. So um, again, there is this, um, there's this, uh, you know, they might be training their, their staff internally. Um, Parkinson's Resources, we offer a long-term care training um, for facilities. Unfortunately, the facilities do tend to come to us and have to request that training for their staff. And as Julie mentioned, there is high turnover um, in staffing, so we do try to um, really um, gear that more towards uh, management staff and um, have that kind of trickle down. So we do kind of encourage um, people as well to get trained, um, have the, having facilities trained. Uh, uh, one thing that we do recommend, um, again, because this is a huge industry with a lot of moving parts, is um, one, educate yourself, which the, you're doing right now. Um, two, make connections. So people like Julie, um, we do have a social worker on staff, and um, she is a great resource as well. Her name is Heather Balducci. Um, attend a support group, talk to other people with Parkinson's disease. And then um, also, as Julie was kind of mentioning, is just being very honest. So if you are kind of um, interviewing different facilities, is to go ahead and just make sure that you have a, a list of questions that you have ahead of time. and um, and really try to, to make sure that all of your needs are being addressed um, when you're trying to find a facility. And then also just be an advocate. Um, again, Julie kind of talked about communicating with, with staff, um, and it's really just also being an advocate for yourself and your needs. Um, so I'm gonna get off because we're getting a few more questions, and I'm gonna hand those over to Julie. And again, um, if any emails are coming in that are a little more specific or answer questions, I'll go ahead and email those people directly. Um, okay, you're not gonna see my face anymore, but we're gonna get to some questions, thank you. Okay, I'm actually gonna start with some questions that Melissa sent me ahead of time that you folks have sent in. So one of the questions, is a memory care just a locked assisted living facility? And Yes and no, the, the staffing ratios are so much better and they do have to have specific dementia training to work in a memory care facility. They offer some of the same physical care, but they do need more dementia training in order to be on that unit. Um, another question is, is it possible to stay in your home and receive financial help? Medicaid can offer um, some minor benefits and the best place to find out about that would be to contact the Medicaid office but you can start at the Aging and Disabilities Resource Center and if you have a PIN their phone number is 855-673-2372 but they may only offer um, you know three hours twice a week. It's not extensive assistance. Another question is, does a senior living community allow more than one dog? Most don't, but it's a case by case basis. So it would, it would just mean calling, talking about the size of the dog, the disposition of the dog, um, things of that sort to determine whether or not they're gonna take more than one. Most communities want a dog to be 25 or 30 pounds or less. So big dogs generally don't work in a community. Um, again, case by case though. I mentioned, um, someone had asked about their income being too much and I did mention the income cap trust and there are elder law attorneys out there that will help you file that. If you have any legal um, ability and knowledge, you can also get the actual form off of um, the Oregon State website, which is uh, oregon.gov. And you can then Google or search for the income cap trust forms. I tried to do it for my own mom and wound up hiring an attorney to help me with it because it was beyond my ability. <laughs> um, 
it's um, another question is communities in rural areas. Um, they're not as prevalent as they are in the Portland metro area, but we belong to a an association called the Oregon Senior Referral Agency Association, or OSRA, O-S-R-A-A. And we have members of OSRA throughout the state, um, Medford, Eugene, Bend, uh, Salem, you know, maybe not in Burns, <laughs> but definitely throughout the state. So um, if you look up the OSRAA website, perhaps you can find somebody in your area that can assist. Again, had, or Melissa had mentioned, um, you know, are there specific programs for Parkinson's residents? They might have exercise programs that fit everybody, but they're not necessarily geared towards Parkinson's alone. Some communities do have support groups that meet once a month on site. And um, I think the biggest question we get regarding Parkinson's and living in a community is about medication management. The carbidopa levodopa is so time specific that we need to make sure that those medications are be de being delivered in a timely manner. And there are tighter restrictions for that drug than there are for most drugs. I think it has to be given within a 15 minute window on either side of the prescribed time. Whereas most drugs, I believe the community has if I remember right, 30 minutes on um, either side. It could be an hour on either side though. So um, with regards to the medication, that's the biggest sticking point and you wanna advocate for yourself about the timeliness of the meds. I believe there's one community in Vancouver that states that they have Parkinson's related um, programming specifically but we don't cross the, the river in our services. But if somebody is interested in learning about that community, we can hook you up with somebody that does cover Southwest Washington. Another question is identifying strategies to remain in your own home as long as possible. I think one of the key factors that you could do is to have a physical therapist and possibly occupational therapist come in and evaluate for home safety. They can recommend things such as rugs being removed or grab bars being installed, things of that sort, and give you tips to um, stay in your home as long as possible. Let's see, I'm reviewing the questions here. Um, we talked about payment options. Um, one question is, when is it time to move into independent living? And that's different for everybody, but a lot of folks tend to move when it um, becomes difficult to cook and clean, or they can no longer drive. That's a big one. If you're not able to drive anymore and you want to still be able to, to get out and not worry about how you're gonna to get to the grocery store next time, things of that sort, that's often a good time for folks to start looking for independent living. And let me tell you, I'm, I'm a social human being. I'm gonna to wanna to move to independent living. I, that's gonna be a goal of mine when it's my turn. Um, but it's not for everybody, so you have to make that decision yourself. But there's so much going on in independent living. It's You find a lot of joy where you might be isolating at home. The other recommendation I'd like to make is make sure that you tour before a um, crisis hits. Um, I'm not seeing 
we don't want to see people at the last minute being in crisis. So I'm communicating with Melissa because I'm not seeing new questions coming in. <laughs> That's because you're doing such a good job. We're not getting any new questions in. <laughs> oh, okay. Fabulous. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Um, yeah. So I think that kind of wraps it up. Um, that's the bulk of the questions. And again, Melissa can email me additional questions and I can respond to those specifically, um, either to individuals or to Melissa to pass on to it directly to individuals. Um, and then Julie, a couple of people are, um, are viewing this webinar from um, Washington. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any recommendations on resources or contacts for the state of Washington? Yeah, there are a couple of OSRA members that um, work out of Vancouver, um, beyond Vancouver. We've got um, some more. There's one that covers, I think, the bulk of uh, the state called Choice Advisory. And then there's um, one called Graham and Graham that kind of covers the I-5 corridor. But if you um, look in your computer and just Google adult placement agencies or adult senior housing providers, um, you could probably find some other options or I can send you names and phone numbers uh, via email. The thing I want to caution you on is there are large internet companies that when you Google a specific property, um, you might want to look at, you know, ABC community down the road and you Google their name and you w actually wind up getting these internet um, registry folks. They, they will blast your name and circumstances to multiple communities and you will be inundated with calls, which not everybody wants that. So I caution you in using the large internet search engines. Um, if, if you want the more personal touch, like, like we offer. So um, keep that in mind. Great, thank you so much, Julie. Um, that is great for everyone to know. Um, a lot of things can get lost in the internet, so thank you yeah. for that. Um, okay, well, we are um, two minutes to one, so I would say with no new questions, we're going to go ahead and, and wrap it up. Um, so again, everyone, thank you so much for attending. Thank you, Julie, for doing this as well. And there will be a video recording of this webinar available on our pro YouTube channel, um, likely within the week. And uh, you can always go to our website, or if you have any issues, feel free to call our helpline on, um, and one of our staff will walk you through that. Again, please feel free to email me at melissa at parkinsonsresources.org. Again, I have a few um, specific questions that came through that I will go ahead and email as well, um, so you might receive something from me. And again, Julie, thank you so much for this helpful information. and. Um, Stay tuned for our next webinar, which is going to happen on April 24th. We're going to be talking about Parkinson's disease and how it may affect your vision. Um, but this concludes our webinar broadcast. So thank you, everyone. <laughs>